Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, there aren't many people who can boast the dual distinctions of a degree in neuroscience and being named as Simon Cowell's favourite songwriter. But with her new album, Our Version of Events, out next Monday, and her single, Heaven, a hit in the charts already, soul star Emily Sande proves that she's got a great future coming her way. This is her in action. Next to me there, Emily, your, your latest single, your yes. next single, yes. Yes, that, uh, that's the new one, the third one off the album. Right, and did it, was it like you said, that really basically a song, when you write a song, you expect to do the whole thing in a day, and if not, you put it on one side? Yes, I think so. Usually the best songs for me come very quickly, so I know as soon as I start banging my head against a wall, then I should just leave it alone and it, it, it's not supposed to be, usually. Yeah, yeah. And so, in this case, you, the idea started with the phrase next to me. Was that the inspiration or something else in the song? Yes, uh, next to me, I wanted a very simple song and next to me to be the main message, not to be very complicated. So um, that was a very quick one, yes. And so when did you, when did you really first writing so start writing songs? Um, I wrote my first song when I was eight, Brilliant. and um, I just I loved it. I mean, it wasn't very good, but um, I enjoyed just creating something from nothing and, and, and learning the structure and the craft of songwriting I thought was really exciting. Mm. And so that's how, and, and you, do, you do expect to finish it in a day. Yes, yeah. And then, that's fascinating. And I mean, and which, I mean, the answer probably is both, but which are you closest to and most passionate about performing or writing music? It's difficult because I do enjoy both and they're very separate, but I think I'll be a songwriter longer than I am a performer. <laughs> so I probably songwriting, you know, yeah. I, I feel like I'll still be writing songs when I'm 60 or 70. So yeah. um, probably songwriting. I think you'll still be appearing on stage. Yes, <laughs> I well. hope so. Yeah, that'd be good. Yes. It? That would be good. But the, uh, but so yeah, the, whatever happens, the songwriting yeah. Will last and will last and last and yes. so on. Yeah. And uh, do you have particular people who've been an inspiration to you in your in my career? Um, yes. I mean, when I was really young, Nina Simone was the first person I heard who really inspired me to write and to to want to play piano and to I guess be an artist as opposed to just a vocalist. So Nina Simone was a big influence to me when I was young. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 was the family full of music? The house, the family house, full of music too. Uh, yes, I mean it was, but definitely noisy. And my dad was a big music fan; he still is. So he introduced me to people, you know, great vocalists like Anita Baker, Tracy Chapman, Nina Simone. Yeah. Um, so I guess it was my dad who brought in those influences oh, yeah. in my life. Yeah. And so, who of the ones you mentioned, or someone, else, who are the inspirations? Who are the real? ones you look up to most. Is it Nina Simone? Definitely Nina, but then when I got older and started to explore music for myself, like I just loved Tracy Chapman, how she wrote, and I, I really started to pay attention to tones of voices and poetry and lyric. Yeah. So Tracy Chapman, Joni Mitchell, um, really individual women. And, and honesty and raw emotion, yes. you said somewhere, those are the most important qualities in the song. Yeah? Yes, I think so. Well, melody, is, is, is obviously big, but once you have that nailed, then it needs to be honest. I think if you sing out of key for a little bit, then it's fine, as long as your message and sincerity comes through. Yeah, yeah. and Heaven has been a huge hit for you, hasn't it? Yes. Did you, do you know in advance when you've written a hit or not? I have an instinct. I you have. Do. I feel like I really love this song, and I can only hope other people will. And Heaven was the first thing I released as an artist, so it was, it was quite affirming for it people to enjoy it as much as I did. It was really lovely. Oh, that's fantastic. And you write for other people as well as for yourself, don't you? Yes, yeah. Leona Lewis was one, yeah. Uh -huh. Who else? Uh? Who else? Um, I've been doing some writing with Alicia Keys, which has been good fun. Um, Susan Boyle, which yeah. was oh, yeah. quite different. Yes. And then a lot of people in urban music in the UK, like Professor Green, Tiny Temper, um, yeah, it's been good fun. So right across the board. So, but is a song different 
when you're writing it for someone else? Is it less personal? Um, sometimes. Usually I'll write the song before I give it to the ah. artist. So usually I don't really know who it's for, but the ones I keep for myself are a lot more personal and something very specific to my life. Mm. Yes. And so now you've had this terrific launch and development from that and things are going terrifically. What, what, what are your main ambitions now? My main ambition? I guess to really establish myself in the music scene you know, right now I'm still a newcomer, so I'd love to, in two, three years, be really established. And yeah, that's how, know. how long does it take not to be a newcomer? <laughs> another year or two? I don't know. I hope, I hope another year or two, yes. Yeah. Do you think of yourself as in part a soul singer or predominantly a soul singer? How important is that description? Um, I think what I do is soulful. I don't know if I, I put it in one box of soul music, because I love experimenting yeah. with different genres. But definitely, I mean, I'm definitely a soulful singer, yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and when, when was the moment when you really realized that you were going to successfully make it? I mean, what was the moment when you, hey, this is all coming together and... I don't know, I don't know if you ever really know if it will last, but... Um, I guess when I first came through as my own artist, because I'd been behind the scenes for so long, so I was quite nervous about really introducing myself by myself. So when people really acted, really reacted well to Heaven, it, it gave me a great feeling and really gave me confidence to, to trust my instinct. But you were nearly, nearly a doctor, weren't you? Yes, yes. You spent three or four years? I spent four and a half years at Glasgow University, and um, I loved it. It just wasn't... It wasn't my dream as as music was, but I, I would love to go back at some point and finish. Yeah, yeah. Would you? Yeah. Yeah, I would. But uh, but but you 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 treat yourself at the moment if anything goes wrong. <laughs> you analyse yourself. Yeah. Um, yes, but um, I've forgotten a lot, so probably yeah. not the best <laughs> <laughs> the best treatment. And what's the long term dream apart from still still singing as well as composing at sixty to seventy? <laughs> but but what's what's the real thing? Is it to write a fully fledged musical, or is it to do a series of albums, or what? what what's the dream? Um, I guess the dream, I would love to write for a film. I'd love to get involved in a lot of British film. Um, so oh, that's yeah. kind of in the next five years, but I, after that, I'm not sure. Yeah, right, yes. not sure. And, the, uh, and I read, read in the paper you're engaged. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. And your beloved doesn't want you to name him in public, yeah? No, he's a, a very serious scientist, so he's, he finds this whole world quite bizarre. So he <laughs> said, keep my name out of it, and, you know, I respect his decision. For that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, well, we wish you all the happiness in the world. Thank you. And all the hits in the world. Thank it's you. great to have you here. Please come back and see us again soon. Thank you. <laughs> If extraterrestrials made an Earth landing in 2012, they could be forgiven for thinking that global brands rule the world, rule supreme. No longer content with inundating us with products from the cradle to the grave, companies are targeting babies in the womb, repackaging childhood nostalgia and selling it back to us. One man who understands the power of the product is brand guru and marketing maestro, Martin Lindstrom. Martin, welcome. Thank you. Give us an example of how brands are trying to reach babies, in the, w in the womb even. Very scary observation we made. What I realized was and is today that we actually are affected by not only the sense of sound but also the sense of taste while we're still in the womb. This has been confirmed by numerous scientific papers published over the years. But what we did know until recently is that there's brands which now are using this to their advantages, in particular in the Asian countries. And scientific and scary and futuristic as it may sound, is actually the case that we have coffee and chocolate brands, even shopping malls, which basically are giving pregnant women uh, sweets 
with infused coffee. So when the pregnant women are eating it, they, they basically are priming their unborn babies to have a preference for it. So what we've seen in Philippines is exactly this taking the place, where newborn babies actually already have a preference for something as unusual as coffee at the age of one or two years. That's, that's, that's riveting. And then does that continue? Do they, do they, the brands attack the young children as well? Well, more and more, because a lot of brands are, are very disparate. You have to yeah. remember, I'm one of the evil ones. I'm also a brand guy advising Fortune 100 brands. But I also do think that we need to put a line in the sand and say there needs to be some ethical guidelines. And what we see happening right now is a lot. Uh, for example, we see that 65% of all the brands you and I use when we are adults actually were decided when we are four or five years old. Why is that? Because mom is buying the brands and we get used to it and it kind of reminds us about the good old days as we grow up. We call that the rosy memories. And the rosy memories have now, from a scientific point of view, been proven to be the case in our brain. We actually see the past more positive than the present time. So brands are plugging into that right now by playing on the nostalgia and the good old days because the more we're insecure, the more there's a recession around us, the more we want to go back in the time. So give us an example, if you could, Martin, of of a trick uh, or more that's played by a brand owner on children or young adults or whatever. An example of the sort of tricks that are played on us. Well, I think one of the most scary scenarios we observed as writing the book was uh, how certain companies now are releasing computer games free of charge to kids between the age of six and eight. Now these games are small penguins which have to survive and you have to put dress on them, but suddenly this whole game stops and it says, would you like to have some more points? And little Charlotte, seven years of age, will click yes, and there'll be a questionnaire appearing. And the questionnaire will say, what type of car is your mom driving in? And what time is your parents going to bed? And what type of preference does your dad have for shaving cream? She fills out the questionnaire, unknowing that the, she actually is part of a plot here, and she gets 10 points extra so she can feed the penguin. These are some of the techniques we're seeing happening right now. And what about, what about someone who has a a good brand campaign, but a poor product. Well, I uh, think do they still survive, or in the end, it would be nice to think that the wise people of the world, that we all <laughs> sort it out in the end, but we probably don't. The good news is, no, they do not survive. We time after time see that the consumer thank God is actually very skeptical and actually very intelligent. And because we are so informed and because in reality, right now, consumers are so well connected that they can tear down a brand in a matter of weeks, or they can build up a brand in a matter mm -hmm. of weeks. So no, brands with poor quality products or services do not survive. But there is still a period of time where they will get a lot of money out of the consumer w without the consumer being aware of what really goes on. And things like makeup for eight-year-olds and things I read about. I mean, maybe seven-year-olds soon. I mean, going for people when they're young and vulnerable, in fact. Well, we see that more and more happening, and I think the, the, the observation we have now, in particular in the UK, is that we've seen some of the largest retailers actually selling a bras, selling paddings for bras, to, to girls who are seven and eight years of age. We see there is an obsession to, among young kids to pretend like, and young girls in particular, to pretend like they're much older, and the marketing industry is pushing that a lot. But we also see as we get older that the industry is now targeting a lot of other things. Uh, I don't need to tell you that um, the men are now on the list for the cosmetic companies. The biggest growing segment right now is, is men. Men for moisturizing. Cream. Moisturizer and cosmetics in general. And what the industry is doing very cleverly is, of course, to make that entire category become much more masculine. My overall headline here is, again, I believe in brands, I love brands, but I think we're now at a stage where we really need to ask ourselves the ethical question about, are we going too far in desperation to gain more customers? Absolutely. And what is the difference, in your eyes, between a brand and a product? Well, from, me, from my point of view, the difference is that brand is all about an emotional connection. You feel like you kind of love it. You have this special affair which you can't really describe. And I'll just explain what the difference is here. A product is really, if we take a test done with McDonald's french fries. A product is really, you take french fries in a, in a brown paper bag with no logos on. And you take exactly the same product in a brown paper bag with a logo on. Because that exact experiment was conducted with kids. Kids in 86% of the cases said, I prefer the taste of the french fries in that bag, even though it was exactly the same taste in both of them. 
but they actually were not eating what's inside, they were eating the emotions uh, which really was associated with it. So that's really what brains are. Well, that's very clear. We want more of this. Will you come back and we'll go through some more of the tricks? Absolutely. That are being if you, you dare to listen to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great to have you with us, Martin. Thank you. Martin Lindstrom there, talking to me earlier on. Now, China. China remains the world's second largest economy and has accounted for about a quarter of global growth in recent years. But the IMF forecasts that China's growth rate will decelerate this year and may even need to inject a stimulus package into its economy should the euro crisis continue to deteriorate. Now, as far as 2007, Premier Wen Jiabao uh, characterized China's expansion as, quote, unsteady, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. But in Maonomics, why Chinese companies make better capitalists than we do, economic provocateur Loretta Napoleoni argues that we're witnessing the beginning of the collapse of capitalism and the victory of, quote, communism with a profit motive, end quote. She highlights what the West and the rest of the world can learn from China, and she's here right, right now to talk about it. Loretta, let me start with the first question, which is obviously has to be, how do you define your, that word you use in the title, Maonomics? Well, Maonomics uh, is an analysis of the success of the Chinese model, this capi communism or communist with a profit motive. But really, the book is not about China so much as it's about us. Why the Chinese managed to reap all the benefits of globalization, and we, the West, who created globalization, actually are in crisis. Yes, well, I mean, why, why is China so successful then in getting its message across? Because China has an economy that is uh, much more flexible than our economy. I know this sounds uh, crazy because everybody thinks, well, Chinese are communists. But in reality, what China has done is to adapt communism to the needs of global capitalism. Now, we haven't done that. And why haven't we done it? How haven't we done it? What should we have done? Well, because we are very uh, rigid. We are very ideological. I look at the euro crisis, for example. We're approaching this crisis, trying to solve it uh, through the instruments. They actually created the crisis, which is you know, the neoliberal kind of uh, economic doctrine. What we should do is do what the Chinese have done. Think outside the box. Do something extraordinary, something unexpected, uh, in order to reshape our economy. But we're not doing it because we are very entrenched in our ideology. Well, what, what do we need to do? What do we need to change urgently? Well, for example, what is happening in Greece uh, is unacceptable. If a, a union, if a European Union, in order to function, to maintain a common currency, requires uh, the destruction of the economy of one of its members, clearly this union is not working. Now, we should think about this. So perhaps the solution is to produce an alternative system whereby we may have you know, one euro, which is a strong euro, and another one you know, applied in the periphery in order to help the countries in the periphery to catch up with the countries of Northern Europe. Well, we're not doing that. There are things in the papers today. There's um, a bigger than, expect, bigger than expected drop in exports and so on and that's in China and there's slower demand for goods within China and more difficulty in selling some of the goods abroad. So even China ain't perfect. I mean, should we want to copy China? Not politically, probably, because that, mm. that leads away from democracy, but should we try and copy China's economic system? Well, we can't in the West uh, because, uh, of course, you know, the Chinese model works in a developing country. So I mean, let's not forget China is still a developing country. We are in a post-industrial society, so we got to develop uh, our own model. Now, of course, uh, we see in Africa, we see in Asia, mm, many countries trying to emulate uh, a bit you know, the success, the economic miracle of China. But it's not definitely our case. Now, for what concern the rate of growth of China, of course, is slowing down because we are in a world uh, global recession and of course China will feel the impact but the issue is how strong that impact is going to be in 2007 we've seen a decline rate of growth only in the last quarter 
of you know the the year and then after you know china started growing again because of domestic demand and let's not forget there is 1.3 billion chinese in china that it's a continent, so it's sufficient if the right stimulus are put into the economy, and the Chinese do have enough money to do that, to sustain the economy even if we have a world recession as we are. But what about the, the situation in terms of people saying now, and we see uh, Angela Merkel going to China and other people going, and we're all saying, will you help us out of this crisis? You've got money to spare, money to burn, um, help us out of this crisis. Is there any likelihood that they will? Well, the Chinese have the money to save all yeah, of us. But do uh, they have the will no, to do it? No, I, absolutely, they're not going to do it. I think you know, they want to help because, you know, of course, uh, a contraction of the economy in Europe will have an impact uh, on China and on the rest of the world. But they will, will not do it until we have a clear policy to get out of this situation. Now, we do not have a clear policy. We don't have a policy for growth for example, all we have is a policy for austerity, which is actually contracting growth. So until we produce a sort of growth outlook for our economies, the Chinese won't do anything. One other thing I must mention to you is, why is China joining with Russia to bolster this dreadful Syrian regime? Why are China doing that? Is, that, what, is it political, personal, emotional, or I screwy? I think uh, that what the Chinese are doing uh, is maintaining, uh, trying to maintain a certain equilibrium in the Middle East in a moment in which we have major crisis, economic crisis taking place uh, around the world. Now, it's not a political decision in order to back a regime because, you know, another regime would be, you know, worse than this. Uh, absolutely not. I think, you know, they are concerned uh, of the increase uh, of crisis areas in the world. So their decision is, you know, let's keep the situation under control in Syria, which of course is not going to happen like that, uh, in order to wait and see if the other crisis will be resolved. And then they might change their policies, China? They might get firm with Syria? I think uh, that eventually the Chinese uh, will understand that this policy is wrong. Now, let's not forget that this is a year of change in leadership in China. So we're witnessing the last months of a regime uh, w which will go away in the fall. So this is a very delicate moment for China to make major decisions. Uh, that also you know, has an impact on the way uh, they're acting towards Syria. Thank you so much indeed, Loretta. We'll follow this, follow this saga. Probably the China saga will dominate world headlines for the next 30 years, probably. I think so. And we'll watch it all that way through for 30 years. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Loretta. You. Well, that's it for this week, but uh, my thanks to all of my guests, of course. Uh, Dominique de Villepin, Emily Sandé, and of course, Loretta Napoleoni here. Um, next week, we'll uh, once again have an array of fascinating guests, of course. Uh, they'll include the renowned economist, the incredibly wise economist, Paul Krugman, who will have ideas not just about what the situation is now, but where it's going. And then we've got the man who's hoping to enlarge the European Union by creating a new independent country. That man is Alex Salmond, and the country in question is Scotland. He wants Scotland to break away from the United Kingdom. That's also on the agenda. Lots more besides. Do join us then, seven days from now, for another Frost Over the World. For now, bye-bye.